Okay, we're going to talk today about how to find God's will. We're going to turn first to Galatians chapter 1. I think this is a subject that most Christians kind of struggle with at some point in time. You know, you kind of get to wondering, okay, I have some talents here that the Lord's given me. You know, what am I supposed to do? You know, all Christians, I believe, are called into ministry of some sort. I don't believe that there is such a thing as a, you know, a pastor gets called into ministry and the other people don't. No, I don't believe that. Uh, in a sense, we're all to be preachers of the gospel. You know, not pastors, but we're all to be able to preach, to be able to, you know, we've been, the ministry of reconciliation has been committed to Christians. But how do you find God's specific will for your life? Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, the first thing that God wills for anybody is for them to get saved. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the very first aspect of God's will is that you get saved. That's what God wants for every man, woman, and child out there. Turn over next to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. All right, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not God's will to send anybody to hell. Okay, con- it, contrary to what the hyper-Calvinists teach, you know, they teach that God creates people for heaven and He creates people for hell. Now, they don't often come out and admit that, but if you boil their philosophy down, that's what it is. Elect and non-elect. You know, God creates people for hell. Well, that's a lie. God's not willing that any should perish. Okay? And a lot of people will say that, but then they don't talk about the next part of the verse. It says, but that all should come to repentance. Now, is it possible for somebody who does not have the Holy Spirit to repent? A lot of people say, no, they can't. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they don't have you know, any knowledge of sin. Well, let's turn back to Romans chapter 2, and we're going to see about that. Do lost people have a knowledge of sin? You know, there's a the big popular thing right now in the churches is this thing of easy believism. You know, just uh, pray a prayer. Yeah, believe and receive, you know. It's just... That's all there is to it. You don't have to have any kind of knowledge of sin because after all, the lost can't know. Well, that's not true. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. Okay, and here we're going to deal with you know, what happens when you have some heathen in the jungle somewhere. Uh, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So you have heathen people... You know, because you're dealing here again, you have the Jews and the gospel starting to go to the Gentiles. So this new thing is happening that never happened before. It used to be that God dealt solely with the nation of Israel, but now it's starting to go to the Gentiles. So what about those Gentiles that the Christians haven't reached yet? Okay, that's that's a question. And and are there people today that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, absolutely. And it's not their fault. I mean, there are countries where Christians can't get in. So what happens? Well, let's continue. Verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Now look at verse 15. Which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Okay, let me stop there for right now. Notice it says the law is written in their hearts, and their conscience bears witness. 
I have a book, and I went and forgot to bring it out, <laughs> but it's called... Um, Eternity in Their Hearts? E yeah, thank you. Eternity in Their Hearts. I couldn't think of it. I kept thinking of the law in their hearts. <laughs> and it's about... It's a missionary, Don Richardson, who was a, a missionary to Papua New Guinea, and he went over, and they were the very first white men to get in contact with these you know, tribes out in the jungle. And they, they basically, when they learned the language, they said, you know, now what are your laws? Well, you know, we, we think that you shouldn't kill. You know, we punish for that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't murder people. And, you know, you should never, you know, mess around with another man's wife. And, you know, we have laws on that. And you shouldn't steal. And, and they basically went down through the Ten Commandments as essentially their belief system. You know, they never were given the Ten Commandments. How did they have it? Well, it's written in their hearts. Exactly. Um, but look at verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I just wanted to include that verse in there. You know, a lot of people think that they're going to get away with things. Nobody found out about that. That was a secret. I got, you know, I did it. No one saw it. Well, <laughs> God saw it. Okay. Uh, but let's look at an example, actually. Turn back to Genesis chapter 20. We're going to look at a very interesting example of a heathen that actually had obeyed the law. Genesis 20. We have the story of Abimelech, who was a Philistine. Okay, read here. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. He was afraid, and so he said his wife was his sister. Verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. <laughs> For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? She said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even her even she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men said, well, what's the big deal? Who says it's wrong? It all depends on how you look at it. Is that what they said? No. The men were sore afraid. Why? Think about something now. Did they have the Ten Commandments? No. The Ten Commandments weren't even given yet. Did they have the Bible? No. <laughs> no scriptures were available yet. How did they know that adultery was wrong? It's written in their hearts. God created them with that thing written in their hearts. And isn't it interesting today that couples that cheat, they don't do it in the open, at least not at first. They'll meet at some hotel, some place out in the country somewhere. Why? Why are they afraid to do it openly? Because they know in their hearts this is wrong. You know, and it's like that with anything. The first time somebody smokes a cigarette, they don't do it in front of their parents. No way. I remember we had neighbors, and they were definitely not saved. I mean, very rich, wealthy people. And I remember looking out the back window. I wasn't spying on them or anything, but, you know, I looked out the back window, and their son is out around the back of the house, you know, be, leaned over, and he's got a cigarette, and he's, he's looking all around, you know, and he lights it, and he's taking some puffs on it, and he's looking all around, and Parents start coming up the lane and puts it down, you know, stomps it out and, and walks around the house. Oh, I'm not doing anything, you know. Why? He wasn't saved. Why did he do that? He knew that that was a sin. 
that first time we went out door to door and started talking to a girl. She had a cigarette up here on her ear, you know, behind her ear. And as we're witnessing, she just kind of slowly gets it, you know, puts it down here, kind of. <laughs> we didn't say anything about her cigarette. We didn't say, you're smoking, you're going to hell. No, we didn't say anything. But she could, she knew it was wrong. Why do teenagers go off somewhere and sneak off somewhere and drink? You know, they, they know it's wrong. And it's it's not just the law. It's, you know, they don't want to get caught by their parents. It's just amazing. And... The, the sad thing is that as time goes by and you sin more and more and more, your conscience begins to be killed and you can effectively sear your conscience. And the Bible talks about that. God gives people over to a reprobate mind. You know, the whole thing with the sodomy is, you know, they, the, the statement, they came out of the closet. Well, what were they doing in the closet to begin with? <laughs> you know? See, it's it's accepted, but not at first. You know, at first they probably it's very shameful. But here you have a heathen man. He's not a Jew. God was not, you know, Abraham. There is, you know, the Jews are traced back to him. He's a descendant of Shem. This guy's a Philistine. He does not have the Bible, and he does not have the Ten Commandments. And yet he knew that adultery was wrong. So, can a lost person have a knowledge of sin yeah absolutely they do why do you think that they don't get saved i mean if salvation is just this magic prayer that you pray and you don't have to change your life or anything why doesn't everybody get saved See, it's not consistent but now let's say okay god's will is for you to get saved so you get saved now you're a christian now what is next what are god's will you know the steps towards accomplishing god's will in your life how do you find that out? Turn back to Romans chapter 12. The very first thing that the Lord wants you to do when you get saved, I believe, is uh, something that's very much absent in the modern church. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It almost seems, you know, conspiratorial to even say this. And what's that? Nonconformity. And, but that's what the Bible teaches. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do you owe God something when you get saved? Sure. He purchased you with his blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. You think that your life is your own? That you can just do whatever you want from then on out? No. You have to do what God tells you to do. That's why people don't want to get saved. They don't want to not conform to the world. They want to do what's popular. Well, as a Christian, the very first step in, okay, you're saved now. You've been washed in the blood. Now you have to realize that the world system is evil. And you cannot conform to it. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? So right there you have three different types of the will of God, by the way. Good, you know, a lot of Christians hit that one. It's There's some good things that you can do as a Christian. Acceptable is, well, you're doing some kind of ministry for the Lord, but it's not... The perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is when you realize the talents that God's given you and you apply those talents and do exactly what God wants for you to do. Now, of course, that's the most difficult one to find out. And that isn't going to happen overnight. That's going to take some growth spiritually. But can you grow spiritually if you're conforming to the world? Absolutely not. No. You have to not be conformed to the world. That's the first step. All right, turn over to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5.17. There are a couple of verses in the Bible, in the New Testament here, which I think a Christian should have memorized. And this is one of them. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
Now you can read about it in John chapter 3. Jesus is speaking and he says that men are to be born again. And they're kind of confused. They say, how can you be born again? How can a man that's old be born again? You know, Jesus is speaking about spiritual rebirth. When you get saved, the life that you had before is now, you have to put that away. And you have to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are born again. You now have the Holy Spirit residing in you. And you're a member of the body of Christ. Something has to change there. And you see these quote-unquote conversions and nothing changes. And they act like the world. They look like the world. They talk like the world. And they have the same feelings and attitudes as the world. Sorry. Didn't take. It says that's a condition there. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. It doesn't say when a man's in Christ. It says if. See, you are to test. You are to judge. You are to say, wait a second here. You know, that guy there, oh, boy, I don't know. You know, and there's, there's quote-unquote Christians that do some really horrible stuff. And, you know, oh, well, that, they're saved there because they say that they're saved. No. <laughs> I don't think so. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All right. So now point number two. First thing that you need to do to find God's will in your life is don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed. And by the way, I didn't cover this, but by the renewing of your mind, how to renew your how do you renew your mind? By reading the Bible. You don't say, oh, you know, it's this this is not a regular book that you say, well, I read that one, then you stick it on the shelf. No. It's gotta be daily. You have to feed on it daily. That's how you renew your mind. All right. Point number two, turn over to chapter eight, second Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. Point number two in finding God's will for your life is you need to give of yourself and have charity. All right, Second Corinthians 8, 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. You know, it's studies have found the uh, Barna Research Group. I don't agree with everything that they put out, but but uh, they found that the highest um, amount of Bible reading time among different groups of people were the people that had the lowest income. They were the ones that spent the most time in the Bible. You know, who are the strongest Christians on earth? They're not Americans. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's. The Chinese, the people that are persecuted, anybody, any real Christian, truly saved Christian in, in the Islamic world, <laughs> there's, there's your strong Christian. Okay, When it'll cost you your life, when it'll cost you income, when it'll cost you reputation, whatever, that's when you're strong as a Christian. Not when things are going good and you got plenty of money and plenty of food and everything else. I don't like thinking that way. you know. I, and of course, the you know, average prosperity gospel, modern Christian, they can't stand that thought. But it's what the Bible teaches. These were the strong Christians back then, these ones that had the deep poverty. Uh, verse 3. Now look at this one. You want spiritual power? It says, For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Okay? They gave themselves first. They didn't say, well, you know, I got my career to think about. I got, you know, other things to think about. They gave themselves first. You know, there's an old uh, saying, if you want joy, you go by the letters there, Jesus first. Others second, yourself last. You know, and there's a lot of truth in that. But now look at uh, verse 9, chapter 8, verse 9. You want to be Christ-like? Look at this. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Do you think about what God did there? 
Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh. I mean, totally contrary <laughs> to the way we would think that God would appear. I mean, nobody here was born in a stable. I mean, it's incredible. The poor birth that he had, you know, and a carpenter? I mean, come on. At least go to a doctor or a lawyer or something, you know, a carpenter. You know, that's what he picked. Yeah. A lowly birth. And why did he do it? For us, you know. So Jesus Christ even is a picture of how we should be as Christians. Okay, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Of course, I covered this in a lot greater detail in, a, in another sermon, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but this is the chapter about charity. And the word is charity, by the way. It's not love. The new perversions got that wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Let me just stop there for just a second. As I said in the other sermon, okay, you have the gift of prophecy, you understand all mysteries, you have all knowledge, and you have faith, enough faith to, to move mountains. But why do you want those gifts? Is it so that you can be puffed up, so that you can be a big shot and be on all the major TV shows and go around doing tours and get your own tour bus and things like that? Is that why you want those gifts? See, if you have those gifts and you don't have charity, it profits you nothing. It doesn't mean a thing. Okay, but what is what is charity? Well, it's giving of yourself. It's self-sacrificial giving. Uh, verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What really matters in this life is what you give up, what you give to other people, how you help other people. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. I didn't include this, these verses in my sermon on charity. And uh, I really needed to, so I'm going to cover them here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Boy, some of the brethren are kind of lacking in those, in those areas there. I mean, <laughs> meekness, long-suffering, humbleness. Verse 13, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You want to be a perfect Christian? Have charity. That's the most important thing. All right. So point number one. Uh, to find God's will, nonconformity, and a transformed life. Point number two, giving of yourself, meaning charity. Now, point number three, turn back to Ephesians chapter six. Point number three is going to be routine duty. Ephesians chapter six, verse five. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. 
Now, I do believe that they were there were servants as far as bond servants. You know, the word we would use would be slave. But, you know, the Bible usually says bond servant. Um, but the point is here, I think this does apply to anybody that actually has an employer, anybody that works. You know, what what type of worker are you as a Christian? What type of, of worker should you be as a Christian? You say, well, I have a rotten boss. doesn't matter. You do things as unto the Lord, you know, and God will get glory for that, by the way. If you're a good worker and your boss is rotten to you and you just keep going on, that'll be a testimony. Okay, so it's important that, you know, it's it's God's will there, it says it, that, you know, that you do right. Um, verse 6 there says, doing the will of God from the heart. All right, turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Turn back, rather, to Galatians chapter 6. And here, this is one that you can kind of use to uh, encourage yourself sometimes. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. <laughs> you know, sometimes you want to faint, sometimes you want to quit, but uh, just keep keep at it. All right, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. The next uh, way to find God's will is to forsake sin. First Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Okay, look up at verse 4 again there. It says, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. This body of flesh that you have is corruptible. This is the vessel. Okay? This is not, you know, this is not really you. I mean, the Bible talks about that you're not to fear them which kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. Okay? They can't destroy the soul. Um, that's the whole truth for a Christian. Your soul and your spirit are eternal. This body of flesh is something that's just going to be, you know, down here, it's going to rot away eventually. Okay, this is not the body that we are going to be given for all of eternity. So this body right here is what we have to walk around on this earth with. Now, whatever sins you commit as a Christian, your soul is redeemed, okay, your spirit is quickened, your body is corruptible. Your body, you can still serve sin. And when you sin, God will punish your body. Okay? Your soul is redeemed. You don't have to worry about that. You're not going to lose your salvation. But your body is a different story. And I've seen this thing. It uh, talks about another place. I don't think it's right here, but it talks about... Um, I can't think how the verse goes. But basically that people are sinning and for this, you know, and that they're... Well, it's about the communion thing. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. Yeah. Sleep. Yeah, that's... Yeah, and many sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see that thing. And you see this thing in time and time again where Paul says about whom I have delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, when you start sinning, messing around... Do you have it there? Yeah, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 29, and 30. Um, Start at actually verse 28. Well, just, just go ahead and read it. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves... 
we should not be judged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now that, specifically speaking about communion, when it comes time for communion, it's a very reverent time, and you you should examine yourself. <coughs> and, you know, it's a time which is important, and at that point in time, you kind of have to look at yourself and you say, okay, I'm, where am I wrong? Where am I in sin? I need to get this stuff fixed up. I need to get it corrected. But what happens is a lot of Christians are just, ah, whatever. Not a big deal. Yeah, I'm doing this. Yeah, I'm doing that. Eh, but, eh. And what happens is the damnation there in that passage, I don't believe, is talking about eternal damnation because you aren't going to lose your salvation. But you can be damned in this life. Big time. <laughs> You know, and there are Christians that are weak, that are sickly, that are sleeping, <laughs> and they get killed before the time that they could have lived to, because they get messed up in sin. So, one of God's wills for you is that you should forsake sin, that you should possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. And again, what is sanctification? Setting apart from the world, being separate. Okay, Romans chapter 6. We'll go there next. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Oop, let me buy it. All right, Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many as of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Second Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. There you have it. Verse 7 For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. You know, that's something else there to think about. You know, again, we take it for granted. We don't really think about that. None of us here this morning, I, you know, I know everybody here is saved. None of us here this morning are ever going to actually die. You know, the body? Yeah, maybe. But our soul? Nope. Oh, everlasting life. Okay? So that's really, really something to think about. Um, verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Kind of interesting. Let me stop real quick there. All sin leads to bondage. Every single bit of it. You say, oh, well, God won't let me do this and God won't let me do that. Yeah, because he knows best. <laughs> Righteousness, When the more sin you give up, the happier, the healthier you will be. The more you'll enjoy life. God's not going to take something away from you that's, that's good and, you know, wonderful. <laughs> All right, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was, which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For ye, at, excuse me, for as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. 
For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And of course that can be applied to both saved and lost. When you sin, you get paid for it. All right, uh, point number five. The will of God is that you be thankful. First Thessalonians 5.18. And of course I covered this last Sunday uh, with the sacrifice of Thanksgiving. But uh, we have this holiday coming up called Thanksgiving and I think it's a very important holiday. And we are to be thankful for what we have. First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's God's will that you be thankful. Okay, first Peter chapter two. First Peter two verse thirteen. Next thing that you should be, uh, if you want to do the will of God, is uh, that realize that you have liberty, but that that liberty should be, um, you shouldn't use that liberty, you know, for an occasion of the flesh, but you should use it to do well. Okay, First Peter chapter two verse thirteen: Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Uh, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, this is something uh, you see there, um, verse 14, it says about the, the uh, governors and them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. In Romans 13 and here in First Peter, you see this thing of secular rulers, that they are there to punish evildoers and to praise those that do well. It defines the type of rulers that we as Christians should be in submission to. When the the law is good and they're not persecuting Christians, submit to them. Great, fine, no problem. Now when they start to praise the evildoers and go after them to do good, well then you got a problem. And then you have to obey God rather than man. But as long as the as the rulers, the secular rulers are doing what is right and are being reasonable, Submit to them. You know, be polite to them. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a lot of the street preachers out there, you know, even the good ones. I mean, they, they get radical. And they'll throw the law on the policeman's face. The police come over and they're try to, trying to be reasonable. I saw one. These guys were out protesting a gay rally and they had uh, big white signs and it said homos with the red circle and the slash through it. And, the, and this police officer came over and he's like, guys, you know, you can't hold those signs up. Why not? We have constitutional rights. We have freedom of speech. And, and the, the cop's like, look, it's offensive to the people. You could have scripture. You can say, you know, quote verses of scripture. We'd be okay with that. But this is, you're just trying to make them mad. You're just trying to be antagonistic. Don't do, you have no right to tell us this. You know, we have our constitutional rights and civil liberties. The police officer was trying to be reasonable. There's nothing wrong with what he was saying. And, the, and this, these particular street preachers, a lot of times, they're just out there just saying stuff. They don't even quote scripture. You know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that, and it's just their own words. You know, and I believe that they're saved and I think that they're trying to do right, but they're just trying to make people mad. And then, and then when the people get mad and they yell back at them, they say, oh, we're being persecuted for righteousness sake. Yay, you know. No, you're being persecuted because you're a bunch of jerks. <laughs> you know, 
there is an aspect of meekness that comes in there. You know, and, and then you have the ultimate radical extreme, which is this Fred Phelps guy, Westboro Baptist Church. That guy's a moron, you know, and he was he was, you know, fined for a million dollars or something sued or something like that. Good. He deserved it. I, don't, I mean, I, I looked into the guy. I don't even think he's saved. Honestly, I mean, I think that he's actually the enemy posing as a quote unquote Christian. You know, he's, he's a rotten individual. And the Constitution you do have freedom of speech, but there's a limit there. You know, if you're out just just being a total jerk and and making trouble, they shouldn't protect you. You know, there's there's no reason for that. You know, so anyways, if you are out doing some kind of a street ministry and the police come to you and they say, "Hey, what are you doing?" You know, while well, we're just passing out gospel tracts. You know, as long as they're nice and they say, "Well, guys, you know, we." We've had some complaints and whatever. Okay, fine. You know, if they come over to you and they say, that's hate crime, you're not allowed to do that. Well, at that point, you're probably going to have to resist and just say, well, you know, we're, we're ministers of Jesus Christ. We're, we're out here to give the gospel to people and we're not doing anything wrong. We're not disobeying any laws. You know, there's a sense in which you can use law. There's a sense in which you can, you know, abuse it. So the point is, use your liberty to do well. Okay, and, and there again, do you think that these police officers that are going out after these street preachers and they get mouthed off by the street preacher, do you think any of those guys want to get saved? Do you think that they're impressed by the street preacher's testimony? No, not at all. You know, and I've seen other videos of, of cops that come up to the street preachers and they're and they're very nice and very cordial and and, and everything, and it's fine, no problems. So you should try to do well. Use your liberty to do well. And finally, look over chapter or uh, yeah, chapter three, verse ten. This is the last one. First Peter three ten. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers they may, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing and again that goes back to the whole thing of public ministry you know it's a it's a blessing actually to be pers to be excuse me to be persecuted for righteousness sake it's not this horrible thing. But now if you're a jerk with it and you get persecuted, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't count. Um, right now, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, trying to make myself into some kind of hero, but there's a Catholic on YouTube that's, you know, written a bunch of nasty emails to me and everything. And my instant reaction is, I'm just going to write back and just blast this guy out of the water, call him a loser and everything. And it's just like, no, because that's what he wants. So I wrote back an email and it was pointed, you know, and I mean, I but I didn't call him any names or anything like that. And, I, you know, I tried to write very nice to him. And, of course, he wrote back and <laughs> made fun of me again. You know, OK, <laughs> I look forward to more, you know, conversations with him in the future. <laughs> I don't care. Whatever. You know, he's not rejecting me. He's rejecting Jesus Christ. And, the you know. The Word of God. So, the will of God for a Christian. Number one, nonconformity in a transformed life. Number two, giving of yourself and with charity. Number three, routine duty. Number four, forsake sin. Number five, be thankful. Number six, use your liberty to do well. Number seven, suffer for doing right. So that's it for this morning.
Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.